Hi everyone! Our topic of discussion for today is immunofluorescence, its basic research uses, and its procedure on a simple level. First of all, what exactly is immunofluorescence? Well, it is a type of indirect immunohistochemistry, and it is the easiest and most widely used method of optical detection of proteins. In general, immunohistochemistry is utilized to determine the subcellular localization of a protein in a cell or tissue. To elaborate further, immunofluorescence is where a protein's localization is visualized via a fluorochrome reporter molecule. In the diagram below, the blue triangles represent the antigens on the cell membrane and the pink and purple Y shapes represent the antibodies, which have a green fluorochrome attached. The fluorochrome molecule can be attached to either a primary antibody or a secondary antibody. So what exactly is the goal of this technique? Well, the key to this process is to have the ability to visualize the fluorochrome attached to the antibody when it is being analyzed through an epifluorescent microscope. Now we're going to talk about the basic procedure of indirect immunofluorescence. Your first step is to obtain a sample. Then you will prepare your sample. Following preparation of your sample, you will then block your sample. Next, you will wash and incubate with a primary antibody, followed by a second wash and incubation period with a secondary antibody. Lastly, you will observe your specimen underneath the microscope. The first thing you do when starting the procedure is obtain a sample. When performing immunofluorescence, you can use either cells or a dissected tissue. In order to prepare for this sample, the cells or tissues must be fixed to the dish. This is generally done by using formaldehyde. Next, the fixated cells or tissues are taken to a microtome, where they are cut into thin sections and mounted onto slides. The next step in immunofluorescence is blocking the sample with BSA. Blocking a tissue is done prevent, to prevent the nonspecific binding of the antibodies to other antigens on the cell membrane or epitopes. The antibodies are unable to bind to other epitopes because of the block in place. This helps re to reduce background and increases the signal that we see when we look at the sample under a microscope. After blocking the specimen, we then have to incubate with the primary antibody. The blocking process already prevented nonspecific binding, so once the incubation period is over, the remaining antibodies are washed away. Next, we have to incubate the specimen with a secondary antibody with a fluorochrome attached. This antibody is also only able to bind to, to a specific spot because of the blocks put in place. Once the, once the incubation period is over, the excess secondary antibodies are washed away. After completing all of those steps, you are then ready to view the specimen under an epifluorescent microscope. The fluorochrome attached to the antibodies will emit light when excited by a specific wavelength of light. The light that is emitted from the specimen is viewed through the lens. With optical detection, you can then determine where the specific protein is localized. Though there are many research uses for immunofluorescence, a couple that we have chosen to talk about are diagnosis of certain cancers, drug development, and muscle diseases. In the diagnosis of cancer, specific tumor markers labeled with fluorochromes, can be used to determine if a tumor is benign or malignant. Drug development can use immunofluorescence by testing for a drug's efficiency. This is done by detecting activity visualized by fluorescence. Immunofluorescence can also aid in muscle disease diagnosis when detecting for known abnormalities, which are typically located in the sarcolemma, extracellular matrix, or the nucleus. Now that you've heard about the basic research purposes, what does this actually look like? The figure to the right shows the picture of a single sample of a neuron being illuminated with two different types of fluorochromes. The green area is where the neuronal marker is present. The red is where the ESET protein is being expressed. So when these two pictures are overlapped, you can see that the neuronal marker and the ESET protein are located in the cell body of the neuron. We hope this screencast helped you to understand immunofluorescence, its basic research uses, and its procedure just a little bit better than you did once before.